Okay, so then we are live now. And with that, uh, I would like to welcome everybody to today's session of the Tübingen NeuroCampus seminar series. Uh, my name is Dominic Gontarek, and I'm a PhD student in the lab of Thomas Euler. Today, I have the great pleasure to introduce our guest, Professor Greg Swartz from Northwestern University in Chicago. Professor Swartz earned his PhD in molecular biology and neuroscience in the lab of Michael Berry at Princeton University, where he stayed uh, for a postdoc before continuing his scientific career as a fellow in the lab of Fred Rieke at the University of Washington. During this time, Professor Swartz collaborated closely with Rachel Wong to link anatomical and functional measurements into bottom-up retinal circuit models. He then moved to North Northwestern University in 2013, where he's the Derek T. Vale Professor of Ophthalmology. Professor Swartz's lab seeks to understand the computation performed by retinal circuits. In particular, they are working towards a comprehensive classification of retinal ganglion cells that includes physiology, morphology, and gene expression patterns for each cell type. In addition to that, his lab wants to establish connectivity maps from the retina at the level of identifi uh, identified cell types. In order to understand the synaptic and circuit mechanisms of retinal computation, they used electrical recordings together with anatomical circuit mapping, single cell transcriptomics, and computational modeling. Today, he will introduce us to web portal to explore the catalog of mouse retinal ganglion cell types in his talk entitled Towards a Comprehensive Classification of Mouse Retinal Ganglion Cells, Morphology, Function, Gene Expression, and Central Projections. I'm really looking forward to the new stories he will tell us about the bursty suppressed by contrast retinal ganglion cells and the M6 IPRGCs. And with that, Professor Swartz, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you so much, Dominic. I'm really excited to be here. I mean, in my office, but it's it's really, I've, I've missed seeing all of you, but it's a nice silver lining to this that we get to all be here in a large group around the world to share our science together. So this is a story that I've been working on for a long time, really, since I started as a professor. And I'm really excited to share it with you today. So today I'll be telling you about a comprehensive classification of mouse retinal ganglion cells on all of these different Basis, morphology, function, gene expression, and central projections. So as you all know, parts lists are really important and particularly in neuroscience. So cell atlas projects really represent one of the frontiers of biology. And this has been recognized by large institutions like the Allen Institute or the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative that are working on single cell atlases of the human body, the brain, all sorts of things like that. And in neuroscience, it's important because within a brain region, neurons have heterogeneous physiology, morphology, gene expression patterns, and projections, and function. And in my view, and in the view of many other people as well, the next generation of systems and circuit neuroscience really must embrace and understand single cell heterogeneity instead of averaging it out into the average response of brain areas. And as many of you know, our field of retinal neurobiology is in a position to really lead the way. And I want us to be the shining example for the rest of systems neuroscience about the right way to do single cell understandings and single cell physiology and morphology and genetics. Because we have some really unique advantages among vertebrate systems. Of course, we can use ex, an ex vivo preparation, take the retina out of the eye and use naturalistic stimuli, which are light. Right? That means when we're recording the responses of neurons, we're not just recording their electrophysiological properties as you would in a slice preparation of the brain with injected current. You're also measuring the upstream circuit of the cell because you're using light and getting all the synaptic inputs as well as the physiology of the cell when you're recording something like this, the spikes of a retinal ganglion cell. Um, we're also standing on the shoulders of giants in this field because we have enormous morphological models knowledge, including these large EM reconstructions of entire sections of mouse retina from Helmstadter, Dank, and also from the Eyewire Museum, which I'll show heavily, I'll really lean on the Eyewire Museum quite a bit during my talk today. And possibly most importantly, we have mosaics, so we have a check on whether we got it right. In the retina, as you well know, neurons, and especially retinal ganglion cells, 
form mosaics with their dendrites and their receptive fields to, to evenly tile visual space. So we have a check on whether we got the, the cell typology correct. These are what I would call the three pillars of cell typology, the function of a neuron, its morphology, and its gene expression. And in the retina, we've made great strides over the last few years in measuring all of these for ganglion cells. So on the functional end, as you well know, Tom Bodden and Thomas Euler's groups measured the calcium responses with two photon calcium imaging for the light responses of about 11,000 neurons in the ganglion cell layer and clustered them into 34 plus functional groups. That's a functional catalog of ganglion cells and other cells in the ganglion cell layer. On the morphology end, we have Sebastian Sung's work on the iWire Museum, which lists 47 morphological types, many of which are statistical clusters and statistical mosaics in the way that their dendrites are aligned. And then most recently from Josh Sain's group, we have the gene expression profiles from over 35,000 retinal ganglion cells that have been clustered into 45 different transcriptomic clusters. So there's been amazing progress here over the last four or so years in the typology of ganglion cells, but there's still a major problem. And that's that most of these correspondences remain unknown. We have a few examples like direction selective cells where we have particular genetic markers and we know where the function matches the morphology matches the gene expression. But for the vast majority of cells, we don't know these correspondences. So what we need is measurements of function morphology and gene expression in the very same cells. So I'll show you in a moment our strategy for doing that. But before I do that, I just wanna introduce some ideas about why, so step back for a moment and say, and think about why this is important and what we could do with a full parts list of retinal ganglion cells. First, we could engineer ganglion cell type specific mouse lines with rational design rather than screening all the Cree lines that are currently available, right? Which could be much more efficient. We could assess vulnerability of each ganglion cell type to different diseases. And this was one of the strengths of that Tran et al. paper from the Sains lab. They were looking at optic nerve crush and seeing which ganglion cells survived and which ones died. But if we had a full parts list, we could do this for all sorts of different diseases. Um, of course, in the basics, on the basic science end, we could establish a common foundation for retinal circuit discovery and cellular biophysics analysis across labs. We need to know when we're talking about the upstream circuits of a ganglion cell that we're talking about the same ganglion cell, right? This is critical. Also for cellular biophysics, which I'll talk about later today. And finally, we, this is a particular interest to my lab, I want to determine which ganglion cells project to each of the dozens of different retinal recipient areas of the brain. It's not just colliculus and LGN. The latest effort on this lists 59 different brain regions, actually, that get input from retinal ganglion cells directly in the mouse. And for the most part, we don't know which ganglion cells go where. So really, the next generation of our understanding of the early visual system is going to depend on understanding that map, which ganglion cells go where. Okay, so part two of my talk is gonna be one of these particular ganglion cells that talks about, and this new bursty suppressed by contrast cell, I'm gonna talk about its cellular biophysics. And in part three of the talk, I'm gonna talk about retinal projections, in particular to all of very pretextual nucleus. But first, I have to show you that we actually are able to get this parts list. So before I start showing you this, I wanna, highlight the people who did the work. This has really been a huge group effort. In the six and a half years I've had my own lab, every member of my lab has contributed to this data set. It's thousands of cells at this point, and they're not all listed here, but the key players for today's talk are, and every large group needs a leader, and that leader is not me in this case, that leader is Jillian, the, my postdoc who's really been leading this project from the beginning. She's been absolutely amazing. Um, the other major contributors to the talk today are Zach Jessen, who is a student in my lab and made the machine learning classifier for the ganglion cells. And Zach and Sam together have tirelessly over the last month or two been web developers in addition to scientists to build our website to bring this to the world. Um, Devin has helped a lot with the ganglion cell typology and work that I may or may not have time to show you today. And then the transcriptomics part has been a group effort 
in, started by us and Jeremy Siegel at U Chicago, who helped us with some initial sequencing, and now really being led by Josh Sains and his lab at Harvard, and Karthik, who has since started his own lab at Berkeley, who's doing a ton of the transcriptomic analysis. Okay, so let me introduce my approach in both experimentally and in philosophy in terms of making this full parts list of ganglion cells. So we use an ex vivo prep of the whole retina, isolated in darkness, and we record one cell at a time with cell attached recordings, which of course has the disadvantage of being slow, but has several important advantages as well. Stimuli are centered on the receptive field of each cell, and this turns out to be really critical. So I used to work with multi-electrode arrays, and of course this would be much faster with a multi-electrode array or with calcium imaging, but the fact that our stimuli are centered within 10 microns of the center of the receptive field of each cell dynamically ends up being really, really important. You'll see that later. So because of that, and because we're doing this one cell at a time, our testing stimuli have to be rapid. We use one to three different stimuli that total one to five minutes to type a cell. For morphology, we fill the cells with patch pipette. Following the cell attached recordings, we use uh, immunohistochemistry to, lo to locate the chat bands, or we do single cell RNA seq following the recordings. In the case where we're doing single cell RNA seq, we clean out the area carefully and use a clean pipette and go in and aspirate the soma. So, on the philosophical, theoretical end, this is not a clustering approach. So many of the studies that I showed you on the previous slides were unbiased, unsupervised clustering of some property. Now there's, there's a ton to be learned from that and that had to be done, but that's not my approach in this case. We are using a supervised match to morphology using the iWire Museum as ground truth. That's because iWire and measured the morphology of all 381 cells that had an axon in this area of retina. So it's unbiased in that sense. So it should capture all or almost all of the ganglion cell types. And furthermore, with all this knowledge that we know at this point, I didn't want to make another clustering approach that didn't match to this known ground truth. So for example, if to, it, I don't want to cluster together a bunch of cells that with our small stimulus set seem to have the same physiology, but have dramatically different morphology. If that's the case, then we're not using the right stimuli perhaps to separate them across, but they can't be the same cell type if they have dramatically different morphology, but apparently similar physiology. So we use a supervised approach. And here's our current data set, but really current as of some of the slides here, but always updated in real time. So we have about 1800 cells in this data set for physiology, about 200 for physiology plus morphology, and 81 in which the SANES lab did the transcriptomics for us and matched all the methods to their large drop seek database, but we have several hundred more transcriptomic cells as well. And this is constantly, like I said, being updated. So what I'm going to show you today is that we've proudly matched 42 of our types to cell types in the iWire Museum, which now accounts for 89% of the cells in iWire. So we're not all the way there, but we're getting a lot closer than we have been to a complete parts list of the ganglion cells in the mouse retina. So what's gonna follow are a bunch of slides of galleries of these types. And I don't need you to scrutinize every one of them because that's why we made a website for you to actually explore these things offline. But we'll give you some of the, uh, an idea of the diversity among types and some things that are on this website Then I'll take you through a demo of the website. And then I will show you just a few basic principles that are interesting that we've learned so far about these cells. But each one of them really has their own story. So first, gallery is just the classic PSTH. So here are the spike responses from to a light step from darkness to a rod saturating background of 200 R star per rod per second, just shown for one spot size of 200 microns here. The shading is the standard deviation across cells of this type. We've got different Y scales for each column, but they maintain a Y scale within the column. And some cell types are grouped together here. There's three types of on DS sustained cells that we found for the three different directions, four types of on off DS cells. Those are grouped here. They're separated in some of the other panels. 
But you can see there's a large diversity of shapes of the PSTH among different cell types. You also may notice that there are some of these that look pretty much indistinguishable. So you may be questioning how I can tell, for example, that an M6 is different from an on-transient IY or 6T type. But as I'll show you in a moment, there's other aspects of their responses that are key, that this PSTH alone isn't enough to tell the difference between cell types like this that look similar in just this one spot size. So the next thing we can look at is spots of different sizes. So this is the total spike count in on and cyan and off and black for each of these cell types across different spot sizes from 30 microns to 1200 microns. And now you can see some of these cell types that may have looked similar in the PSDH of 200 microns, like this on transient medium and smaller receptive field have some differences in their receptive field size and their surround suppression. So this is another really important stimulus that we use. And here's just a gallery of these. And then finally, if you combine these two things, you get a heat map of the PSTH across spot sizes. And this is what I like to call the physiological fingerprint of the cell, because now we have both pieces of information. These are now all on the same scale. And you can see the kinetics change with spot size. So we get to see the entire firing rate over different spot sizes. Some cells suppress, other cells become more transient. Some cells even change polarity. This on small, off large cell is on for small spots and off for large spots. So there's a lot of dynamics here that you can see. Cells that look similar in other plots don't look as similar here. So here's this on transient medium and small receptive field. And you can see now they have a different physiological fingerprint, even though one might have seen a similar PSTH for one particular spot size. Okay. So we can look at this in a slightly different way and do principal component analysis on these just for visualization and, and then do the TSNI to look at this in three dimensions. So this is principal component analysis kind of projected down to three dimensions so you can get a sense of what these different clusters of cells look like. So I can run this, oops, I can run this 3D so you can see these different clusters in 3D. So now in this big plot, they're clustered just by my fairly arbitrary groups. So on sustained type cells, on transient cells, these are not types, these are just functional classes or larger groups. But you can see the groups separate to some degree in this 3D space. And then within a group, I have separated them out here. So for, for the on sustained cells, for example, they're all down here, but the on alphas, the pixons, and the M2s still occupy different regions of this 3D space. Okay, so this gives us the impression that there is some separability among these cells. This is purely physiologically, this is only by that functional fingerprint. But to see how separable they are, um, Zach built this machine learning classifier that's still being worked on. This is a work in progress, but doing pretty well right now. So this is based, again, only on those functional fingerprints, just based on the response to spots at different sizes, and trained this at a boost-based machine learning classifier to, and cross-validated it to look at each of these cell types and figure out which one it is. And for the most part, it's doing very well. It's not perfect, but many of these cell types are 80, 90% accuracy or more at being able to get exactly the right cell type. And even where it does make mistakes, it often makes mistakes of ones in the same kind of general functional class. So occasionally it'll think an HD1 is a UHD, but it won't think an HD1 is an on alpha or something like that. So for the most part, we're doing pretty well with this machine learning classifier and we're improving this. And this is gonna be on our website so that you can upload your own data and see what this classifier tells you about what cell type it might be. Again, since this is only the physiological fingerprint of spot sizes, DS and OS cells are not separated here by direction and orientation preference, but that's easy, of course, if you run a moving bar or a drift and grading. So for a few more galleries, I'm not gonna say much about this, but here's the unfos morphologies of all these cells. We've got single cell fills of all of them. Um, they, you can look on the website and see that they look like the iWire types, but importantly, these are 3D. So we also have this stratification pattern of every one of these types. And we see really remarkable alignment to each of the iWire types in the stratification profile. And this ends up being very important. 
So there are some systematic issues with our data. It's not as clean as the iWire stratifications, of course, because their data was electron microscopy and ours is light microscopy. But many of these types match remarkably well. And you can see that both the 2D and the 3D morphology match. And then finally, on the transcriptomics end, we've been doing this single cell transcriptomics thing where we record the cell and then suck up the soma. And then Josh Sains and Karthik and Anne and Jillian do the analysis on these. And we've been matching them to the Tranadol database from Sains lab to see which ones of our types match their transcriptomic clusters. And here's the result of that at the moment, which I think is pretty promising as well. So this, again, this is a low N, but we've got many nice matches of particular types. So some of these are confirmations of things we already know. So our cell type that we call an F mini on here matches the transcriptomic cluster that the SANES lab identified as F mini on. They knew this just from transcriptomics because there were some molecular markers like FOXP2 in this ganglion cell type. So they were already able to guess what this one was. But there are many other instances in which they found a cluster but didn't have a molecular identity. So this is cluster 13 novel from their data set. They didn't know what it was, but they knew it was a nice transcriptomic cluster. We've got four matches of this cell to an HD1. So 13 novel appears to match the HD1 ganglion cell. And there are many more examples like this. Another nice one is our on DS cells, dorsal nasal, temporal, and ventronasal. We can get each of them separately but they all appear to map to cluster 10 novel in the tranadol data set. So this transcriptomic cluster appears to be all three types of ONDS sustained cells. So without further ado, you can check these out online yourself. Hopefully everybody looking at it at once won't crash the website, but if it does, that's fine. I'll just buy some more server space. So um, Zach and Sam over the last month or so with a little bit of help from me have built rgctypes.org, which I hope to be a resource for our entire research community for the typology of ganglion cells. And there are a couple of core principles of this website. It is open and online and always will be despite any regardless of the publication status of any of our data, we're going to put our data on there immediately and hopefully data from the community as well. And we're going to update this in real time. We're building a pipeline directly from our data joint database to this website such that we can record a cell on Monday and have it up on the website Tuesday, essentially. So here is a look at what the website looks like. You can follow along in your browser window. I'm going to show just a couple of demos here. So if you click on more info at the bottom of the page, this is the page for the Pixon ganglion cell right here. You can click on that. And then it opens up a little blurb if there is much to say about this cell and references. This cell was discovered by Daniel Kirschensteiner's lab. There's a link to the paper there. And then above, you can see all these different plots for this cell. And you can click on the eye and get some more details about what the plot is and how the data was collected. So we have a light microscopy image. We have an example eye wire trace. We have some example light responses from three cells of this type three pixons. You can zoom any of these graphs by clicking on the plus, get a larger view of the eye wire reconstruction or our light microscopy. Then the graphs below show the stratification profile. You can hover over any of this data and see the actual values if you'd like. The little icon up there allows you to collect the images of PNG and download it if you'd like. This is the position in the retina of every cell of this type that we've recorded. So left or right eye and dorsal ventral position and nasal temporal position. Here's the spike count as a function of spot size for each pixon and the mean shown there. You can hover over any of those and see which cell it is by the identifier in our database. And here's that physiological fingerprint of the PSTH by spot size. So it starts, it defaults to the, large, to the spot size that gives you a maximum response. And then you can click anywhere in this heat map and get the cross section and get the PSTH below. So you can see for each spot size how the cell responds. Okay, so that's kind of a view, a very brief overview of what this looks like for a single cell. But now let's look at the table of all the different cell types. So if we go up here 
and we click on expand table. Now you get all the different cell types. The pixon is highlighted, the reference is there on the left. You can click on it and get back to the data on the pixon, but you can scroll up and down with the arrow keys or click on different cells and get their information on the left side with their references. You can scroll through all 42 of our cell types here. They're all aligned to their eyewire types. You can sort this list alphabetically if you want to look for a particular type everything from not A to Z, but B to U, first D suppressed by contrast to UHD. You can click on the eyewire type and sort by that, which because of the way eyewire cells are named, this gives you a sorting according to stratification from things that are in sublamina one at the top to things that are in sublamina nine at the bottom. You can click on these eyewire links and open the link to the eyewire museum so you can see their version of the cell. You can sort by functional class. So here, this eyewire type is loaded now. This is the 1NI. You can look at their beautiful website of the morphology of these cells, and then click back to ours and click that 1NI and see now how the morphology and eyewire matches the physiology in our data set. Okay. So let's expand the table again. And you can also use this filter function to filter by a particular cell type. So these are all the small on-off receptor field cells. And here's an HD2, one of the types that was discovered in my lab. And you can click reset and get the whole table back. Okay. All right. And then finally, I want to just introduce the couple things on the menu here. Most of this is still under construction, but you can get a little about dialog box about the website. But perhaps the most important functionality is that you can download all this data. So you click the download data tab, you can get the light responses from all 1700 cells in this data set in one MATLAB file. The morphology is under construction, but I will make all the morphology available and the whole transcriptomics data set is available in MATLAB as well, right there. There's some other pieces of this that I'd like to build, but the placeholders are up to tell you where I'm going with this. I want this website to also have information about species homologies and central projections. And in particular, I want to build a table such that we have all of these ganglion cells and then columns for each of the brain areas where they project. And I'm working on some of them in my lab, but I really hope that this becomes a community effort where people will upload their, their data, send me citations to their papers, and we can really build this as a community. So let me just say a couple of the more pieces of content. The machine learning classifier will be up soon, running online and downloadable. So you'll have instructions for how to upload your data and get a posterior probability on what ganglion cell type it is. You can download the classifier and run it on all your data sets as you like. We will we'll put up the table of central projections once we have a decent number of them from the community, from people emailing me their own data and papers on central projections of ganglion cells. And I'd like to eventually have species homology up there as well, citations to which ganglion cell types are homologous between species, especially mammalian species, when, where some of these homologies are perhaps a little more clear. So really, I just implore you all to become a part of this community effort. So let me just close this part by telling you about a couple of the general principles we've learned from this. Of course, every cell has its own whole story and I could talk for an hour on each of these cell types and then we'd be here until next week. I'm not gonna do that, but I wanna give you a couple of general principles that we've learned from this. One is that the relationship between stratification in the inner plexiform layer and function is a little more complex than perhaps had been appreciated in the past. So many, we count nine now, ganglion cell types that have dendrites in the outer portion of the IPL with no off responses. So the outer part of the IPL is supposed to be the off layer. We all already knew that M1 IPRGCs were an exception in this sense, that they stratify in the outer portion of the IPL but have only on responses, but they're not really an exception. M6s do that too, so do all four types of on orientation selective cells, on delays, and both kinds of sustained suppressed by contrast cells. And for most of these cell types, we've also recorded excitatory input currents and never seen any hint of an off excitation. So the outer portion of the IPL is not only an off part. Another 
kind of dogma in the field is that ganglion cells with dendrites between the chat bands in the middle region are more transient, and this is not always the case either. Local edge detectors are particularly slow and sustained on transient types of the IY or 6T type are not all that transient and have a late response as well. All three on DS sustained cells are between the chat bands or right are in the chat bands and the on delayed ganglion cells, the most delayed of all, and it also stratifies between the chat bands. Another dogma that's not completely true is the relationship between ganglion cell dendritic area and receptive field size can also be pretty complex. So here are drawn to scale an M6 cell and an on delayed cell. M6 has a much larger dendritic field as you can see, but it also has a much smaller receptive field. So here are the spike counts versus spot size for these two cell types. And we can see that an M6 has a smaller receptive field peak and a ton of surround suppression, whereas an on delay doesn't peak until you get to about 400 microns and it has almost no surround suppression. And then finally, in general, the size of the stimulus can have profound effects on even basic response properties like kinetics and on-off polarity. And I already showed you a few examples of this. So an HD2 is an on-off cell for small spot sizes. It's an on-only cell for large spot sizes. There's this fun on-small, off-large cell that, as you can guess by its name, changes polarity completely based on the spot size. Even these sort of more, more standard off transient cells, this is what looks like a standard off transient cell, but for large spot sizes, it systematically has this late weird on response that, um, that happens all the time in these and that um, Thomas Munch pointed out in his paper a few years ago. The on delayed cell has a huge kinetic change with spot size. The f mini on is another cell that can be on off at small size spot sizes and on only at large spot sizes. So this means that the centering of stimulus is really critical and this makes this spots of multiple sizes a very powerful stimulus for classification. And that's why we like to call it the functional fingerprint. But it also makes it very complicated when you're doing multi-electrode or large scale studies where your stimulus can't be centered perfectly for each cell. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you at this point that we're nearing a complete parts list of ganglion cells. So in the last two parts of my talk, I wanna show you a couple of the things that we can do with this, with particular stories for particular cell types or brain areas. So first, I wanna talk about the cellular biophysics of one particular cell. And this is this bursty suppressed by contrast, what we call the BSBC RGC. Here's its page on rgctypes.org. And this is a project that's been spearheaded by Sophia Weinbar, a really talented PhD student in my lab. And this is a story about comparing network and intrinsic contributions to the functional properties of a cell. I would say in my time in this field, there's been a much larger focus on the network contributions to the function of ganglion cells than their intrinsic properties. And that makes a lot of sense. Ganglion cells are embedded in these really complex synaptic circuits in the retina. And of course, the function of a cell is largely determined by the synaptic input it gets. A direction selective cell wouldn't be direction selective if it wasn't getting DS inhibition from starburst amacrine cells, right? So there's clearly a network contribution to the function of most ganglion cells. However, there also can be an intrinsic property contribution. And again, with the example of one-off DS cells, we know now that dendritic spikes, their intrinsic properties form an important, have important implications for how they function as well. So this is a story about comparing these two aspects of the BSBC cell and finding what is kind of a surprising result in this case, I think. Okay, so let me introduce the cell first. The BSBC looks a lot like an off-sustained alpha, but I hope I can convince you it's a different cell type. So these are drawn to scale. It has a very large soma, just like the off-sustained alpha. In fact, in iWire, this is type 2O, and it is the fourth largest soma after the three alpha cells. It actually has a very similar soma size to an off-sustained alpha. Also very similar stratification. There may be some subtle differences as picked up by iWire that our data seems to match reasonably well, but very, very similar stratification beyond the off chat band, okay? But there's some interesting differences in their physiology. 
So here's a, one example light step response from an off-sustained alpha in green and a BSBC in purple. And you can see that they both look like basic off cells, right? They're both suppressed by an on light and then they fire afterwards. But if you zoom in, the actual spike responses look pretty different, right? So here, the spike, there's a little bit of spike amplitude adaptation in off-sustained alpha. But the BSBC has this extreme spike amplitude adaptation where the spikes get so small that they may be lost in the noise completely in our cell attached recordings. It's like a 20 to one variation in spike amplitude, which I shudder to think what this would do to a multi-electrode array spike sorting algorithm. We can quantify this actually by even before this light step, just from these pre points, the, the coefficient of variation of the spike amplitude is much, much higher in a BSBC than it is in off sustained alpha. So this suggests that there may be some physiological difference in the cells, even though they look kind of similar in how they're responding to light. There's also a molecular difference. An off-sustained alpha is an alpha cell, so it stains positive for the molecular alpha marker, SMI32. A BSBC is always SMI32 negative. Okay. So they're different cells, but what about their function? Do they have any really important functional differences? So here's an off-sustained alpha responding to a bunch of different contrasts, and we can see it's suppressed for on steps, and it's increasing its firing rate for negative contrasts. Here's what the BSBC does. For positive contrasts, it looks quite similar to an off-sustained alpha, but for negative contrasts, it actually suppresses its firing. So if you look at the contrast response profile of these two cells, an off-sustained alpha is a nice classic off cell with a monotonically decreasing contrast response function. And a BSBC, now you can see why we named it what we did, is a suppressed by contrast cell. Its peak firing rate is actually at zero contrast and it's suppressed for both positive and negative contrasts. Okay, but the aficionados, the aficionados in the audience might be wondering at this point, if this depends on what we count as a spike, right? Because I showed you in the previous slide, these spikes get rather tiny, right? So how do we know, am I counting all of these as spikes? And is that part of the problem? Is it just that they're getting small? So how do we know when a spike is a spike? Well, turns out there's a really clear way to, to find that answer. So if we look at this in a whole cell, we can see that this BSBC does something really interesting. For positive contrast, it hyperpolarizes, as you might expect, and that's why it fires fewer spikes. But for negative contrasts, it actually depolarizes and goes into depolarization block. And this is very reminiscent of work by Mike Doe's lab that showed that M1 IPRGCs can do this. They can go into depolarization block and stop firing for, in that case, particularly bright, bright lights. Here, negative contrast is actually pushing this thing into what looks like depolarization block. So, but again, what is a spike here? These look small, but how many of these count as spikes and which ones don't? Also inspired by the amazing work in Mike Doe's lab, we tried this crazy experiment because if he can do it, we wanted to try to do it too. And Sophia actually performed these paired axon soma recordings where she recorded with a patch pipette the soma of a BSBC and did a suction recording onto the axon of the same cell. So we know what counts as a spike is something that ends up being propagated down this axon, okay? So here's what one of these recordings looks like, and you can see the large somatic spikes are nicely represented in the axon, but these small ones with the red arrows do not make it down the axon, okay? So to quantify this, we can quantify these spikes in a number of different ways, but one of the most informative ends up being the maximum slope of these spikes. So if you look at the maximum slope and you plot this versus failure rate, very small max slope gives you high failure rate and eventually this asymptotes to very reliable transmission. And the border here is about 50 volts per second. So remember this number for later, but what I wanna show you is that action potentials with a max slope greater than 50 volts per second are transmitted reliably, both in BSBCs and off sustained alpha cells. But ones with smaller than 50 volts per second may not make it down the axon. Okay, so now these cells I showed you already have different contrast response functions. Now you might believe that these are actually different because we know what a spike is propagated down the axon. But they actually have very similar synaptic inputs. So here's the excitatory and inhibitory synaptic input to the off-sustained alpha and the BSBC. 
And you can see they look quite similar, plotted on the same scale as conductance. Here's the excitation and inhibition curves for an off-sustained alpha and a BSBC. And they look, again, quite similar. So to really know whether it's the synaptic input or the intrinsic properties of these cells that is causing their difference in function, we use dynamic clamp. So here, instead of showing any light responses, we simulated the light responses that we had previously recorded in voltage clamp, and we injected them in current clamp into these cells with dynamic clamp. And we use the synaptic blocker to make sure we don't have any residual light responses, and then what we do here is we can swap the conductances between cells. So we first identify an off-sustained alpha by its light responses and later its morphology. And then we can use the conductances from a BSBC injected into an off-sustained alpha. Or we can swap the other way and record a BSBC but inject the conductances from an off-sustained alpha. So what's shown here is the conductances for a simulated negative 100% contrast step. And what you'll notice is that the off-sustained alpha, even if it has conductances from a BSBC, increases its firing rate to this step and doesn't block. Whereas a BSBC, even when it's injected with conductances from an off-sustained alpha, does undergo depolarization block. So we can quantify this here, off-sustained alphas on the top and BSBCs on the bottom. And what I'm showing here is the spike rate for negative and, 100, and positive 100% contrast. And the gist of this is that the off-sustained alpha, regardless of where you take the conductances from, acts like an off-cell. It increases its firing for negative contrast, and it, de it decreases its firing for positive contrast. The BSBC, regardless of the conductances, acts like an SBC cell and it decreases its firing for both negative and positive simulated conductances. Therefore, the intrinsic properties rather than the synaptic inputs to this BSBC are key in controlling the different spike responses. So what are the key differences in their intrinsic responses? Well, we can measure a lot of things, the max slope, the spike amplitude, the peak, the full width at half max, I'll just show you the max slope since I showed you before that was important. And what you can see is the off-sustained alphas tend to have a larger max slope in their action potentials than BSBCs. And now if we plot this as a function of the membrane potential right before the spike, you see something interesting. So for every spike here, what Sophia did was took the, the one millisecond before the spike and measured the membrane potential right then and then looked at the max slope. So as you would expect, if the spike starts from a more depolarized potential, more sodium channels are inactivated and it's gonna have a lower slope. This is true for both cells. However, the BSBC has a lower max slope to begin with, and it has a higher resting potential to begin with, such that the resting potential of the cell is shown in this dotted line here. Within only eight millivolts depolarized from that, the BSBC hits this danger zone where spikes are not transmitted whereas an off-sustained alpha has more than 15 millivolts from its resting potential, where it's still re reliably transmitting spikes and hasn't gone into depolarization block yet. So in summary, the BSBCs have a small depolarization range, only about eight millivolts before they reach block. So what's the cause of that? We don't know, this is still ongoing work, but part of it may have to do with the different composition of sodium channels. So 49 TTX at five micromolar, can be used as a really selective blocker of NAD 1.6 channels. So we use that blocker on an off-sustained alpha and we get an increase in spike rate. If we do it on a BSBC, it doesn't seem to really do anything. And if we now look at this plot again of the max slope versus the membrane potential, what you can see is that with this 49 TTX on in light green and light purple, what we see in light green is that the off-sustained alpha max slope actually goes down and is able to hit this danger zone for a less depolarized potential with this blocker on. Whereas the BSBC seems completely unaffected by NAV 1.6 block. So perhaps off-sustained alphas have NAV 1.6 channels and BSBCs don't, and that might account for part of this functional difference. Um, but this is ongoing work. There may be other things, channel density and the axon initial segment and the length and position of the AIS may also contribute to different differences. So we're measuring the AIS morphology and sodium channel density in these two cells, and we're also modeling the spike initiation with neurons.
Okay, so to conclude, all sustained alphas and BSBCs are distinct ganglion cell types with similar morphology and synaptic inputs, but different molecular identities and functions. The key functional difference in these cells is the shape of their contrast response functions. And intrinsic properties actually account for this difference rather than synaptic inputs. BSBCs undergo depolarization block more easily than off-sustained alphas, likely due to the differences in their sodium channel densities, locations, and types. Okay, so in the last, I'm going to just go only take five minutes on this last part so we can leave some time for questions. I want to talk about this third part where we're determining which ganglion cells project to each of the dozens of different retinal recipient areas of the brain. And this is work by Jared Levine, a postdoc in my lab. And we're looking at ganglion cell projections to the Oliveri pretechnal nucleus, OPN. And as I mentioned, we now know that ganglion cells of the mouse retina project to an astounding 59 different retinal recipient brain areas. And actually this is true in other mammals as well. It's at least 30 or 40 in humans probably. And, but we, for the most part, we don't know which ganglion cells project to each of these different brain regions. So I'm gonna do this in a lot of different brain regions in my lab. That's the plan over the next several years, but we wanted to start with OPN. So why start there? Here's as good a reason as any. I'm certainly gonna stay away from DLGN and SC, which are being done by really excellent people. Um, but more seriously, like it, the OPN also gets a very dense retinal ganglion cell projection and it's interconnected with other visual regions like SC and BLGN and the nucleus of the optic tract. So it may be very involved in vision. And it, the OPN shell does have a well-documented role in pupil constriction. We know that M1 IPRGCs and perhaps M2s as well project there, but the OPN core is the larger part of OPN. It gets a huge retinal ganglion cell projection from potentially different cells and might actually have a distinct function. So here's our experimental strategy. We inject a retro AAV in the brain, and that's not an AAV that wears 70s clothes, but it's an AAV that's particularly efficient in transmission down the axon backwards into a particular brain region like the OPN. And then that's transmitted within actually only several days to the retina. And then we can use two photon targeting to find the cells that are projecting to that area and then do all the same things we do, measure their function, measure their morphology or aspirate them and do single cell transcriptomics. So here's our injection site in OPN in a brain slice. Um, what you'll see here is the AAV in green and CTB, so cholera toxin injected in the eye. So you can see all the retinal projections on this side of the brain in this slice in red and <clears throat> our viral injection in green. And <clears throat> what you'll see is there's a nice overlap region here. And if we zoom in, we can see that we, with this injection, hit essentially the whole OPN. And while the virus certainly spreads into other regions, some of these are regions that are connected to the OPN and some of them are just on the track of our injection like hippocampus, none of the rest of these regions that are hit with the virus are retinal recipient. So this is an exclusive, if we look in the retina, we're gonna see only cells that have projected to OPN. And <clears throat> this is what the retina looks like from these injections. So here's the contralateral side and here's the ipsilateral side. Contralateral projection to OPN is about 100 to 120 cells per millimeter squared in the dense region. Ipsilateral is a much smaller projection, but not zero. We get 20 or 30 cells in the retina per millimeter squared in the ipsilateral retina. But the key question then, of course, is which ganglion cell types are they? And as we expected, we found some M1 IPRGCs. We found some N4 on alpha cells. We found a whole lot of these. So this is an M6 cell. And look at the histogram of cells that go to OPN. This was really pretty astounding when we found this. We expected to see a lot of different things. And we did see a lot of different cells, but M6s account for two thirds of the input to OPN by our estimate. And if you look at one of these retinas actually, what you see is a nearly complete mosaic of M6s. So by a combination of morphology alone and morphology and function, we've marked the M6s here with red crosses. And you can see that they look like they're so dense, they may even be a complete mosaic. And if we measure in this region, the M6 density, we get 23.3 cells per millimeter squared in these dense regions where we look like we may have hit all of them. And by blind luck, actually, the eye wire type N1, 91, 
density, this is the matching eye wire type, has 23.3 cells per millimeter squared. So we may actually be near a complete mosaic of M6s. Well, what do these guys do? They are not typical IPRGCs in the sense that they have small receptive fields. Their receptive field diameter actually is average less than 100 microns, and they have very strong surround suppression. They respond in a very strong and uniform way to bars to movement with different bar widths and speed up to very high speed. This is all the way up to eight millimeters per second. And you can see a relative insensitivity to bar speed and width over this range. So cells respond really with a nice, robust, transient firing peak to all these different, to movement of small objects essentially. And what they don't do is encode absolute luminance with their sustained firing rate. So we did a typical experiment of showing a long sustained change in light intensity up to very high light intensities. And we did this in M1 IPRGCs and we saw a nice encoding of luminance. Um, M6s don't do that. They just respond transiently and they don't have the sustained change of luminance. So in conclusion, M6 RGCs form the dominant projection to the core and most of OPN and they respond to small smooth, moving objects, but they don't include absolute luminance. So this might suggest a new role for OPN in vision. So each ganglion cell type has its own story to tell. And that's where I want to leave you today. I introduced you to rgctypes.org so you can browse on your own all these different cell types. I showed you a little story about the off-sustained alpha and the BSBC. There was a story about network versus intrinsic properties and showing that the BSBC is actually interestingly controlled by its intrinsic properties more than its synaptic input. And that M6, and then I showed you a story about retinal projections, the M6 cell being the dominant input to OPN, which might suggest a new role for OPN in doing something more dynamic than just controlling the pupillary light reflex. And I'll conclude by telling you, you know, we can just keep doing this for the next 10 or 20 years because we've got 30 or more cells and they all have their own really fascinating stories. I'd like to thank everybody involved, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you a lot. So I have, so we have collected a couple of questions from the audience, and I think I would just go through them and ask you some of them. Okay. So there's a question by Philip Behrens, uh, and he's asking, have you tried to predict really new data which had not been collected yet at training time? Yes, so all the um, all our machine learning stuff is cross validated, of course, but in terms of collecting a completely new data set that had nothing to do with the training set, we're starting to do that experiment as well. And actually one of the, so we hope to do that online. We hope people will submit their own data and we'll be able to see how well it fits. We could, we have recorded several hundred more cells since the classifier was trained in the first place. So we can cross validate it on those completely separate cells that have been recorded in a different in different experiments. So yeah, we'll try that as well. One way in which we've done this recently actually that's kind of fun is we're trying to do this on one patch of retina where we type every cell. So I've been doing this crazy experiment with Devin lately where we rip a big hole in a patch of retina and try to record 50 or 60 cells and not kill almost any of them and figure out what they all are. So we can use the machine learning classifier online and see if we can get this right. And we're not 100% yet, but one thing that was kind of cool when we did this the other day is that we, we used the classifier online to tell us which types cells were. And as you might expect for a small patch of retina like this, we saw one of almost everything, two of a few things, but because of mosaics, you're not gonna see multiples of a lot of cell types in a small region like this. This is a 50 micron scale bar. But what we did see, we happened to get three type um, one and O cells near the edge of our region. So these three cells are one and O cells. So I said, why don't I try to patch all three of those and fill those. And we might see a little mini mosaic of the three 1NO cells. And it looks like, they look pretty good. You can compare these three filled cells to what the mosaic of these looks like in iWire and the spacing and dendritic overlap and everything looks about right. So we may have actually found the three neighboring 1NO cells with the machine learning classifier. So that's one piece of evidence that we're kind of getting it right. 
but yeah, we definitely want to cross validate this with new data. Yeah, great. So there's another question by uh, Demokrates Karamanlis. Um, and he's asking, is the light spot you're using UV, green, or both? Oh, great question, great question. So um, yeah, we record where we are everywhere in the retina and we're using um, more bluish, greenish light. So we're definitely hitting M cones more than we're hitting um, S cones. But we're doing this at a light intensity where that's less likely to matter. So all of this stuff is done from darkness to a rod saturating background, 200 R star per rod per second. So most of our signals are not being transduced by cones in the first place. They're being transduced by rods and being screened through cones, but we don't have a lot of color dependence. And as you can see in some of our data, actually we get very homogeneous light responses with the dorsal ventral gradient of the retina. So that's an indication to us at least that we're not getting a huge contribution of color to this. But yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't mean the color isn't interesting. There's a whole other thing to be done at higher light intensities with UV and green light to be able to see how these different cells encode color. Um, then there's another question by Marla Feller, and she's asking, "What's the age of the mouse here of the mice you're using for the experiment?" Oh, great question. Yeah, so I mean, we've used adult-ish, so P thirty plus always, generally later than that. But um, yeah, so so six to eight weeks is our target range for most of these studies. Um, we have used some older ones, and for the most part, we found that there are not major changes in any of these functional types up to one year. We have not done anything with development under six weeks old yet. So that's another whole study as well, and many of these properties likely change in development. But in adult retina, the functional typology and morphology seems to be rather fixed. The transcriptomics is all done on exactly six week old animals in order to match with the data set from the same breath. Okay, so then there's a question by Christian Puller and he's asking, what about the relationship of retinal location versus physiology morphology? So dorsal versus ventral and so on. Yes, so here's, um, you can look at this in rgctypes.org so far. For the most part, at this background, we don't see major changes with retinal position. So here's the position maps of the recorded cells of every type we've gotten here. And it's a whole lot of a null result for the most part, right? So what I want to convince you that you, from this, from this null result that we can see every type in every location, essentially. Some of these, of course, are undersampled and there's not enough N here to really say anything statistically, but it looks like we see every type in every location. It's not like, for instance, the M6s are a subtype of on transient medium receptive fields and we only see these dorsal and we only see these ventral. That's not the case. We see every one of these types across the retina as far as we can tell. That doesn't mean that there aren't subtle functional differences across retinal position, but the differences across retinal position that we see tend to be smaller than the differences between types. We know, of course, that on alphas vary dramatically in receptive field size from nasal to, dem to temporal retina. So that is all folded in here. But remarkably, those differences actually, even though they're large in the peak spot size, end up being smaller than the differences between on alphas and their other more similar cells like pixons and M2s. And that allows the machine classifier to do an excellent job at telling a non alpha is an on alpha, even if it has a small versus a large receptive field from different locations. Okay, so we also have a comment from Adam Maney. I think he's an alumni from your lab, as I've seen on the last slide. So and he's saying, uh, I would add to the wish list some info about the PSDH across light levels. For example, the PSDH uh, of the centrist spot. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that is that's a that's a it's a wonderful comment, and I totally agree. We, for, for particular cell types where we've really studied them in depth and written papers about them, we know a lot more about how they respond at higher light levels as well. Mostly our decision to do this in darkness was a matter of convenience. We're worried about going back and forth between different light levels because of light adaptation. Many forms of light adaptation in the retina can be slow. And on top of that, you've got all sorts of bleaching to worry about when you don't have the RPE attached as we don't in these experiments. 
So because of stationarity, which is absolutely critical in these experiments, we chose to do everything from darkness so that we could go rapidly between cell types. That experiment where I recorded 50 or 60 cell types in a sitting before the retina died out on me would have been impossible if I was taking five to 10 minutes at least to adapt to each different light level in each different cell right or more than that if you're going to test across different light levels so mostly it's a matter of convenience that we were able to get our numbers up by not worrying about light adaptation but that is a great point and just as these cells have very interesting physiological properties that change across spot size i'd imagine they do across light level too in fact thomas munch has shown that right cells can change their polarity completely from on to on off at very specific light levels and different amacrin circuits pop in and pop out perhaps at different light levels. So that's another entire factor in the dynamics of the receptive fields that would be fantastic to investigate. And yeah, we just have not yet. Yeah, that's really great. So then there's another question from uh, Tom Baden, probably that's a bit similar to the question that we had before. And he's asking about, uh, what about the wavelengths that you're using for these stimulus? and probably intensity and like some details about the stimulus. So yeah, sorry, I, 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 I should have put that up. I should have put that up in the slide before. Yeah, it's, four, it's 450 nanometers and it's, um yeah. So rod saturating, but more definitely hitting M cones and rods more than you're hitting S cones. But at this intensity, probably not M cones much. But yeah, once we're able to do this stuff at higher light intensities in a follow-up study, and not just us, I mean the whole community. When I say us, I mean everybody, and post your data on rgctypes.org and really let's do this together. Let's figure out how all these cells respond at higher light levels and to different colors. I think we should all do that, and I think that would be a fantastic way to further perhaps differentiate some of these cells. And to find the ones I haven't found yet, by the way. I mean, the type 25 and eyewire, eyewire, I call the great white whale of the retina. It's a clear, beautiful mosaic. It's about the third or fourth most dense cell type in the retina. And I've got zero represented in this data set, which to me means they don't respond to my stimuli. I'm not missing them every time when I'm recording a whole huge group of cells. I just don't record it, apparently, because it doesn't spike to my stimuli and I must assume it's a non-spiking amacrin cell or something. So there are certainly a few that we're missing and maybe it's color, maybe it's high light level, maybe it's motion, maybe it's optic flow. I don't know what it is that the cell responds to, but it's fascinating. So the ones that we don't have in this data set yet, I think are really cool projects on their own. Yeah, so then there's another uh, question from Mala Feller and she's asking, are the resting conductance different uh, between the bursty suppressed by contrast and the off-sustained alpha? So in other words, how confident uh, you have equal ability to voltage clamp and measure distal synaptic properties equally? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. So um, we've recorded a number of the different intrinsic properties. I didn't show you all of that today. They're, um, their input resistances are quite similar. Many of their other intrinsic properties are fairly similar, obviously not the spiking ones, the sodium channel ones, but because their input resistances are similar and because neither cell is gap junctioned extensively to anything, as we can tell by neurobiotin fills, we feel pretty confident in our ability to voltage clamp them both. And the synaptic conductances are similar enough that it doesn't seem to really matter. Um, another check on that is when you do dynamic clamp, of course, you have to scale the conductances that you inject back into the cell to get reasonable spiking, right? You don't inject necessarily exactly the same conductances back in to get the spiking. You have a scale factor to based on a lot of things, including the quality of your patch. But um, the scale factors that we use for these two cells are not statistically different, which also suggests that our ability to voltage clamp them in the first place and then inject the currents back into them is pretty similar. So I don't think the differences that we see are because of experimental issues in, in space clamp or anything like that. I think they really have different sodium channels and densities and different spike properties. Yeah. So, and then uh, we, so I just gonna ask you one more question before we close the session and put it over to the Zoom meeting where I think everybody can join who wants. I think Thomas posted the information um, in the YouTube channel, so in the, in the chat. 
So and the last question is by Anna Flasitz, and she's asking, are the off-sustained alpha cells and bursi suppressed by contrast cells similar in terms of their transcriptomic profile? Is the reason they are similar in morphology because they are possibly closely evolutionary related? That's a great question. So the transcriptomics, this again, I this is another place where I wish we had more data. Um, the transcriptomics, let me get back to the transcriptomics for a second. Um, we can look right here and see if they're confused for each other in the transcriptomic data set. I believe we don't see that. Here's the transcriptomic data set. So off sustained alphas are here. Do we have bursty? Here we have bursty suppressed by contrast. These seem to map to type 25 novel and the off sustained alphas map to a different one. Um, so they, they don't get confused in this small n data set. They don't seem to be actually all that similar. I've looked at this a bit in our larger transcriptomic, transcriptomic data set, and they're similar because they're both stratifying in the same layer. So there are interesting transcriptomic similarities in cells that stratify in the same place. So all the ganglion cells that are beyond the off chat band have some similarities to each other, and lar largely because of a lot of the stuff that Josh Saints has worked on. There's a lot of molecular, tar molecular factors that target the dendrites to those particular areas, right? So that's part of the answer. But I don't think they're super similar as much as like different directions of one-off DS cells are. But one of the many fascinating things that can come out of this transcriptomics data set is evolutionary conservation trees of ganglion cell types, right? Like using that criteria, we can learn some things about homology. We can learn some interesting things about evolution. I think that's a fascinating line of research. And for the most part, we just need a larger data set to do that well. But we should be able to do that. And actually, you could even use the data set now from the SANES lab once we're able to assign types to these clusters from their transcriptomics. Now one can use their data set of 35,000 cells and start to look at some of those evolutionary correspondences in more depth. OK, so I don't know if we have like if we closing the session now, or I should continue asking some questions because we have some questions or some comments still. So I don't know if we should postpone it to the to the session, like the seminar session afterwards, or if we should do it now. I'm fine either way. It doesn't matter to me. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm happy to. Okay. Answer. I mean, I can also just continue. So then there's a question by Petri from Helsinki. And he first says, like, greetings from Helsinki. Really beautiful work. Um, and he has a question. So what is personally your favorite ganglion cell type in the mouse retina and why? <laughs> nice. <laughs> it, 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 softball from one of my best friends. He had to figure. Petri would, would toss me a softball. It's like a, it's like a Fox News quest, Fox and Friends question to Trump in the morning. Um, I think, okay, so I'm going to tell you about one.